Welcome to the barn. This episode of Welcome to the Barn is being recorded from the United States Hunter Jumper Association annual meeting in Palm Springs, California. Today we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Lola Chambliss. She received her medical degree from the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, her Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences from Stanford University in California. She completed her residency in neurological surgery and fellowship in neurological oncology at Vanderbilt. She also completed a fellowship in minimally invasive neurosurgical oncology at the Center for Minimally Invasive Neurosurgery in Sydney, Australia. Currently, she is the Assistant Professor of Neurosurgical Surgery at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Her areas of expertise include the impact of metabolic disorders on brain cancer, tumor morphometry, and traumatic brain injury. Today, she is here to discuss with us a topic that is probably one of the most important of any of the presentations this week here at the USHJA annual meeting, because it involves your safety. That topic is concussion training. Dr. Chambliss, welcome to the barn, and thank you very much for agreeing to be here with us. We appreciate your knowledge, your education you're about to give us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I am a neurosurgeon. And I'm in practice at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm also a lifelong equestrian. I grew up on a horse breeding farm. My mother ran a sport horse breeding program. And I grew up mainly as an eventer, but riding in a lot of other disciplines as well, like most eventers. I have always had a passion for equestrian sport. And as I went through my neurosurgical training, I became very interested in the issue of head injury in riders. When you were a kid growing up and you were on the barn, who was your favorite horse or pony that you remember like, that's what I really, I enjoy the sport? My horse of a lifetime was a thoroughbred that never raced named Chris Kringle. We got him when I was 13 and I was just really developing an interest in eventing at that point. I had had competed at beginner novice a couple of times with my previous horse who had some soundness issues and we were struggling. And we bought Chris, and uh, he took me all the way through the CCI two-star level, long listed for the World Equestrian Games, and my A in Pony Club. And he was that absolute ideal young rider horse who was not particularly fancy, but was incredibly safe and had a huge heart. And he lived with me on my farm until he was 31 years old, and we just put him to sleep a couple of years ago. That's where I think this becomes you're a horse person first, and then you're a doctor. So you're coming from, listen, folks, this is the real stuff. You know, this isn't some professor up here trying to teach you something. I'm coming from your world. And that's why I think it's so important to have you here. I heard through some conversations, you were an EMT before you were a doctor. How did that kind of happen? I was. When I was in college, I was looking for opportunities to get involved in clinical medicine in some way so that I could confirm this is what I really wanted to do with my life before I made this commitment. And so one of the options in front of me was to become an EMT and work on the front lines a little bit. I was always interested in emergency medicine and trauma in particular, probably in part because of my equestrian experiences, but also probably in part because of watching a lot of ER on TV. And so it seemed like a fun thing to do, and I did that for a year before I started medical school. You yourself suffered a skull fracture after a fall during a novice event course. Was this before or after you became interested in neurosurgery and traumatic brain injury, and specifically the TBI? Yeah, so I've had a few, actually, (laughs) a few concussions or TBIs along the way in my equestrian career. The first was actually when I was 18, riding in a two-star CCI on Chris Kringle. And we had a crash on steeplechase, and I had a basilar skull fracture and a pretty significant injury. My most recent (laughs) significant injury riding a horse was on a novice cross-country course. And uh, that one mentally set me back a little bit because I was riding at a level that I was very comfortable at on a horse that I had purchased and was training and, you know, felt was very well prepared for the level. And it was one of those fluke incidents that happens in horses sometimes. It wasn't even at a fence. We ran into a tree, essentially, on a galloping down a path between fences on a novice cross-country course and just had a little miscommunication. And I basically hit a tree with my face. 
while it was not the necessarily the most dramatic injury I've ever had riding, it was mentally a little bit harder to get over because I felt like I had taken a step back and was riding at a lower risk level and in the safest way that I could. And so it was a little scary from that standpoint. We've all had experiences where a horse puts a hoof wrong. You know, it happens. So those kind of accidents, they're quite common. And that's why helmets are so important. Now, obviously, cross country or steeplechasing, you're going to wear a helmet. You have to. Having been around horses myself for a long time and knowing how many horse people are, at the time of any of your injuries, do you think you are more aware of your injury or were you the typical rider that says, I'm fine? Obviously, the one where you ran in the tree, you knew you weren't fine. But your first one, did you get up and say, I'm okay, I don't really need help, or did you know you needed help? Oh, yeah. I I think I was your stereotypical rider who thought I should hop right back on throughout most of my riding career. And really only my last injury, which was five years into my neurosurgery residency, did I know enough to say, hmm, I need to take a step back and assess what really happened to me here before I just jump right back into things. So I've absolutely had the experience many, many times over of pushing myself to get back on, compete again the next weekend without really worrying about whether I was fully recovered from an injury. Do you feel this information is important to get out there? Was this a conscious decision or a professional choice? And was it something that you knew as a rider, this really isn't out there a whole lot? Or was this something that with your riding and your profession, you decided, hey, this really isn't out there enough? And certainly we have riders for helmets and that type of thing. But I don't think anyone's addressed it quite the way you have. Well, I think in some ways I was lucky to fall into this topic a little bit. As I was finishing my neurosurgery training, I happened to be training at a center that has an incredible, incredible impact in sports concussion. And I had several fantastic mentors there, Alan Sills and Craig Farrell, who are, Alan is an absolute leader in this field across every major sport in the world. He had been working with Craig Farrell, who was a team physician for the U.S. equestrian team for many years, uh, to help out on the equestrian side. And knowing my own interest in the sport and with his own time constraints, he said to me, you know, would you like to start doing a little bit of this because you know, it's there and it's interesting and uh, it seems like something that would be a good fit for you. So I was really lucky to fall into that and to have some great mentors who just opened up that door for me. Once I started getting into this area a little bit more, it became more of a passion just because I started thinking through those patients I was seeing in the hospital with severe TBI after riding accidents, and I started to have conversations with them or their family members about whether they were wearing a helmet or why they weren't wearing a helmet. And I just became more and more frustrated as I saw accidents and injuries that were in some ways preventable that we weren't preventing. And I saw that as a real education issue. So that's what's become a passion. I watched your video from the 2011 Riders for Helmets, and I heard some of the statistics. And it is a little bit scary. Of the approximate 1.7 million brain injuries a year, 12% of all TBIs in recreational sport are equestrian-related. Head injuries in riders account for 18% of all injuries. That's a huge number. Are those numbers still true today? Yeah, and in fact, there's a a more recent study that came out of UCSF, which is a great institution, uh, last year, that looked just at hospital admissions for sports-related TBI. And in that group, so these are more severe injuries than just concussions, in that group, 45% of the hospital admissions for sports-related TBI came from equestrian sports. And we know that equestrian sports per participant level are far less popular than sports like football and soccer and baseball and skiing and snowboarding. And yet we are profoundly overrepresented in that severe head injury group. I'll say all throughout my training, all of my neurosurgical partners and my mentors that were training me would always say, why are you riding horses? You know these are the worst injuries. And every time someone came in with a head trauma from an equestrian accident, they would make me go and see the patient when I was a junior resident because they were trying to convince me to stop riding. (laughs) I think they had the idea that if I saw enough of them, perhaps I would be adequately convinced. Because in the neurosurgery world, it's well known that equestrian sports are very high risk. And, And you look at that and you think, okay, my passion for horses was way before... And horse people are horse people forever. It's not something you stop doing. Absolutely. And I think every one of us makes risk assessments and every one of us does things or has habits that we know are not particularly healthy. 
And I think as every one of us gets older, we make those assessments in a different way too. So I think it's kind of a moving target. Do you think your accidents make you question whether or not to keep writing? I mean, the repeated damage could affect your career now in the medical world. It does. And I think either because of becoming a parent or because of just getting older or because of the amount of time that I've invested in my career at this point, I have generally become more risk averse in all aspects of life. And that includes riding too. By no means would I say at this point that I am never going to be a serious rider again. I I love to ride. I think that the risk can be managed in an acceptable way. But it certainly is very true that I'm a very different rider and a much more conservative rider than I was when I was 18 or 20 or 22. And some of that's the training, and some of that is probably just a natural part of getting older. Can you please tell our listeners in basic terms, what is a TBI? So TBI is a big umbrella term. TBI stands for traumatic brain injury. And so it means any injury to the brain that happens through a trauma. It includes concussion, and that's on the mild end of the spectrum. It also includes what we would call severe TBI. And this could be someone who has such a severe brain injury that they die because of it, or that they're in a coma, or that they're in a persistent vegetative state. So the term TBI is really general and broad, and it's meant to be that way. The natural question after that, then, is can you briefly talk to us about the differences between a skull fracture, concussions, shear hemorrhages? So concussion, by definition, is a brain injury that has no structural abnormality. What that means is it's purely functional. You have an injury to the brain that leads to some functional inability of the brain to function normally. You may have symptoms related to that. But if we image you up and down with CTs and MRIs and PET scans, we're not going to see anything abnormal. If we see anything abnormal, like a fracture, a brain contusion, a subdural hemorrhage, a shear hemorrhage, then by definition, you don't have a concussion anymore. That's moving you up the scale into a moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. In many ways, in the field, tried to move away from the term concussion because I think it's in a lot of ways, misunderstood. So a lot of us are trying to use TBI to incorporate all of those injuries. It's a much more general term. But yet, I say concussion all the time because it's what people are familiar with, and that's what people ask questions about. All those other injuries, skull fractures, shear hemorrhages, contusions, subdural hematomas, those are all anatomic injuries to the brain. And in most of those cases, you're going to have functional symptoms too. So you're going to have headache or confusion or perhaps even paralysis. But you're going to be able to see something on an imaging study, and in some cases, you're going to require surgery to repair aspects of the injury. What are some of the common symptoms of a lower-level concussion or TBI that someone might have at a horse show? The most common symptom of a concussion is headache. 55% of people who have sports-related concussion will have headache. And it's, of course, natural to have a little bit of head pain anytime you get a bump to the head. But I'm talking about headache that persists more than just a few minutes. And so if you have even just that symptom, you have a concussion. Other very common symptoms would be mild confusion. And usually that relates to some of the factual details about what just happened or what you're doing right now. Dizziness, nausea, blurred or double vision. And and those are the things that we see in the vast majority of concussions. Beyond that, you can start to see more significant symptoms like true amnesia. And of course, you can see loss of consciousness. One thing that's really important to notice is that loss of consciousness only happens in 10% of concussions. A lot of people think that if you haven't, quote unquote, passed out, you haven't had a concussion. That's not true at all. 90% of concussions occur without a loss of consciousness. I think it's really important for the listener to understand that Just because you did not lose consciousness does not mean you did not have what could be a a severe head injury. How do you diagnose a TBI at any of the levels we're talking about here? What is the actual diagnosis? So it's really a conversation with the athlete. There is no role for pointing lights in your eyes and (laughs) trying to do some sort of pseudo neurologic exam unless we've got you, you know, in the hospital and we're doing that kind of an assessment. What it is is a conversation. You want to first inquire about any of those symptoms. Is the athlete having headache, nausea, dizziness, 
a lot of these are things that you can't see in an exam. They have to be athlete reported. So you're going to run down that list of symptoms and see if any of those things are positive. And if they are, you're going to stop and say, well, I think you have a concussion. If the athlete's not complaining of any subjective symptoms, then you go into questioning uh, to try to get a sense of whether they're thinking clearly. And so there's a really good protocols out of football literature that we use on the sidelines in NFL games where I work. And essentially what you do is you run through those key questions that that athlete really ought to know. So we're not asking you, you know, who's the current secretary of the treasury, right? We're asking, what's the score in the game today? We're asking, what team did you play last week? Asking, did you win last week? And those are called Madden's questions. They're built for football. But when I think about how we should ask a rider about an injury, it's thinking about similar questions. What horse are you riding today? What day of the week is it? Who else is in your lesson? Where were we competing last weekend? What show are we at right now? What class were you in? Those things that any athlete knows like the back of their hand. And if you see that someone struggles with those questions, then that's somebody who needs to be referred further for a more in-depth assessment. At a horse show, to kind of follow up on that train of thought, talking about the Maddox and the Child's Cat three questions in part, do you think most EMTs or people that are at the show know these questions, or is there an app or something like that that they can have or that you recommend people use that are not trained but can say, hey, maybe we're on a trail ride, maybe we're on a pleasure ride, maybe we're riding somewhere else? What apps or what questions or what really is something that people can use that are not medically trained such as yourself or not even an EMT but can have this information? Yeah, so this is, I think, one of the most important issues of outreach in the sport. First of all, it's critical to understand that EMT and paramedic training and medical school training does not necessarily cover sports concussion assessment. As an EMT, that was something that was not discussed a single time. We were trained to assess someone at a scene and transport them if necessary. And your an EMT or a paramedic is mainly trained to say, does this person need to be brought to a higher level of care and how can I get them there as safely as possible? They're not trained to be sideline sports concussion assessors. That being said, it's really quite easy to learn how to do this and you don't have to be a medical professional at all. And in most sports in this country, you have an athletic trainer who is making these assessments and can be very, very skilled and who I would trust implicitly to do so as long as they've had the right training. I think the best current training module out there is from the CDC website, and that's the Heads Up Concussion Training. You can take that online. It takes a couple of hours. They have all the resources there you could ever look for. You get a certificate saying you've done it. And I think that coming up with a model where we ask at least one person at a competition, a safety officer or an EMT or a paramedic, to have proof that they've done that kind of training and that they're going to be the go-to person for assessing someone for a concussion, I think that that would make a huge change in the sport. And I think that that's also a fantastic resource for trainers, for coaches, for parents, uh, and really for anybody who rides with other people. Because if you have that training and that ability to just make the assessment of everything's okay here or hmm, everything may not be okay and we need to take a break and ask for more help from somebody who has more medical training. That's all you really need. You just covered safety officers a little bit. Is that something at a recognized show or even a non-recognized show that really should be implemented in policy as maybe a new rule change for a safety committee? I think it would be a great idea. I'm certainly not the person who's making the decision about what rule changes make sense within these organizations. But I think that looking into a way to come up with a low cost, but highly efficacious manner of getting riders assessed when they fall would be a really smart move. When do you think it's more important to become more forceful with a rider and more proactive in getting them checked out? Hey, look, I fell off a horse. Okay, I hit my head. I'm fine. I really am fine. When do you say, no, you're not? Well, I think one thing that is important to realize is that someone that's had a head injury is not making good decisions for themselves. So this is different than somebody that falls off, breaks their collarbone, and decides that they're going to go back to riding before their doctor says that they should. You know, that's a that's a personal responsibility issue. It's a safety issue, but this is generally an adult that we're talking about making that decision. With brain injuries, it's a very different 
issue. You are in many ways as an athlete with a brain injury beholden to those people that are around you and you need them to be taking care of you when you may not be able to make good decisions for yourself. And so I think we have to be ready to be a little bit more paternalistic with people when they have potentially suffered a head injury because they may not be able to make the right decision. And so I think we need a bit of a cultural shift in terms of saying when you've fallen and you've potentially hit your head, you need to be willing to sit back and let an objective observer take a look at you and make sure that you're okay before you move on. And I think if all of us made that mental leap to saying, I'm in a position where I may not be making the right decision and I need to let an outsider help me, that that would go a long way. And as a competitor, it's very often difficult to say, I need help. And that really is something that I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. You don't know what you're talking about. And that's where... Well, and I think that that's where there's potentially a role for rules that say, if you have a fall, you have to have some degree of short assessment before you ride again. And people can opt out and perhaps not compete again at that competition that weekend. But if we're talking about putting people back in harm's way on a horse where they may have an injury that becomes much more significant with a second fall, I think that there's an opportunity to say, let's, let's create a cultural shift by requiring that mandatory five to 10 minute sit down and assessment before you move on with the day. And I don't think as a rider myself, I don't think that that necessarily would impact one's overall competitive experience that much. I think there's a way to do it where it doesn't necessarily ruin the weekend for you. The risk of second impact syndrome, is that really a thing for equestrians or is that more of the contact sport? Yeah, it's absolutely a thing for equestrians because we are playing a contact sport. The contact is with the ground or it's with the horse's pole or, <laughs> or their neck or whatever it may be. And so second impact syndrome is rare, but incredibly devastating. I think the answer to this next question is going to be obvious, but the rules committee is currently considering having a required trainer certification for concussion training. That I think is a no-brainer. I think it is a no-brainer. No pun intended. My part there was pun intended. <laughs> I, think it, I think it'd be a great addition. This type of concussion training takes maybe two hours, and I think it could have a tremendous impact both on the trainers themselves and the way they conduct their business and on their students and the way that their students then go on to think about these issues in the long term. One of the factors that as a medical expert and as a neurosurgeon yourself, what height or is there a height that says, hey, we need to pay more attention here. If I'm falling off a horse that's 17-1, you know, 17-2, or I'm falling off a pony at 12-2 or 12-3, is there a height that affects impact? The farther you fall, the worse the impact is. But that's not all there is to head injury. You can actually suffer a concussion without having any blow to the head at all. An example of how this happens in riding sometimes is that someone gets bucked off and they land on their bottom. And that's happened to me many a time. And we all know that that sends a pretty strong, powerful, concussive force through your body. And there have been plenty of riders who have suffered a concussion that way. So there is certainly no safe distance to fall, but the higher you, you are to have a more severe injury. Thinking about someone that would ride a 12, 3, 13 hand pony, they're obviously going to be a lot younger than someone that's going to be riding a 17 hand horse. The brain is a little different for children than it is for adults. Are children more susceptible to a concussion or TBI than an adult would be? Children are more susceptible to TBI. We know that for sure. We also know that women are more susceptible to TBI than men. And then there are other minor differences with, between all of us that make certain people more susceptible to concussion or TBI than others. Those are likely based on genetic differences that we don't totally understand yet. But the same blow to the head for two different people may produce very different results. The other really important thing to understand is that once you've had one concussion, that somehow lowers your threshold for tolerating injury. And so an athlete in any sport that's had one concussion is a four to six times more likely to have a second concussion throughout the rest of their life than someone who's never had a first. So your threshold goes down. And we think that that probably continues to go down a little bit with subsequent injuries. Meanwhile, some of the functional issues that can happen after a traumatic brain injury add up. And so while there is no number of safe concussions, we know that the more you have, the more likely you are to have long-term issues related to that. In your experiences as a medical doctor and as a neurosurgeon in particular, 
Are most occurrences coming into hospitals from competition? Are they coming from people training in the backyard? Are they coming from the pleasure rider? Are they coming from the trail rider? You're the one that's doing this. Where are these injuries coming from? So the vast majority come outside of competition. The vast majority. I cannot think of the last time that I saw an equestrian-related head injury personally in the ER that was from a local competition. And I live in Nashville. It's a very horsey town. We have some major competitions that go on there all year round in a wide variety of different disciplines. I work at the only level one trauma center that includes Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, so we see this a lot. Vast majority of injuries are outside of competition. Many of what we see are your backyard rider who probably doesn't ever compete, or if they do, it's in a local, non-recognized way. They're not a member of any of the equestrian associations. And that's one of the big educational issues, is if you're talking about people who are not a member of any of the organizations, how do you reach those people? As a medical doctor and as a neurosurgeon, what is the takeaway from this? What really do people need to pay attention to here? So I think that riders need to recognize that there's an inherent risk to our sport. And that doesn't mean that we should change the sport, but we need to acknowledge that going in. And I think there's a couple of things that riders can do to manage that risk better. One is to wear a helmet every single time you ride. Certainly earlier in my life, there were plenty of times where I was guilty of not doing that. I was a pretty good helmet wearer all along. I'm a pony clubber and all that. But did I ride in a top hat in a three-day event? Absolutely. Never would do that now with what I know. You know, did I go on a trail ride in Wyoming without a helmet on? Absolutely. The last time I did that, which was a couple years ago, I was the only person in the group wearing a helmet. And of course, I was the only person in the group who really knew how to ride. And, you know, everybody is looking at me like I'm some kind of fool. And I'm thinking, you know, sorry, but this is making a statement here. So I think that's probably the single most important piece of it. Wear a helmet every single time you ride. Anybody who's ridden for any period of time knows that horses do silly things Stuff happens, and it's unpredictable. So don't assume you're getting on a quiet horse for you know a bareback hack up to the barn, and you don't need your helmet. Beyond that, I think that understanding that the old cultural idea that you jump right back on the horse when you fall off is outdated and unsafe is a really important point. I'm not saying that no one can get back on after they fall off, but you need to take a time out. You need to take five to 10 minutes. You need to let your adrenaline settle down. You need to assess how you're feeling. And ideally, you need to have somebody else that you're riding with check you off and say, yeah, okay, you're doing all right. Let's hop back on. Let's walk around for a few minutes. Let's make sure you're not having any problems. And then let's go on with the day. So if you're in training, that's the way we need to be looking at those things. If you're in competition, you know, your competition's over for that ride, that class. So take the time to sit down, wait a few minutes, and reassess yourself before you just jump right back on the horse. As your professional training has obviously increased over the years, if Natasha Richardson had received proper treatment, what do you think her survival success may have been? Well, hindsight is twenty twenty, and you know this is purely an estimate or a guesstimate, I think. But she had an epidural hematoma, which is one of the traumatic brain injury variants that potentially offers the best possible outcome. These are surgical problems. And of all traumatic brain injuries, most are non-surgical, but this is a surgical problem. I see frequently patients that come in with an epidural hematoma that are comatose or near comatose that we rush to the operating room and that are able to walk out of the hospital a few days later. It's an injury where we know that timing is key And if you catch somebody before they have suffered a irrevocable brain injury, then you can often make those patients much, much better, if not back to normal. So I think that in a case like that, if she had gotten to a center with a neurosurgeon early, that she very likely would have had a much better outcome. So Dr. Chambliss, obviously, when someone does have a major brain injury, there's emotional cost to the loved ones, the family, the children, the parents. What's the financial impact? So we know that if you look at severe traumatic brain injury as a whole, the average direct cost of treating a patient for that injury is $3 million. That direct cost just means paying the hospital, paying the doctors, paying for rehab, paying for the 
life flight helicopter that got you there, and those sorts of things. The indirect cost is, of course, much higher because that's your lost wages. That's the lost wages of your parents or your spouse who are taking care of you. And that number can, of course, escalate through all the years that you survive after that injury. Many people with a severe traumatic brain injury are never able to go back to employment. Many people have a number of medical conditions that become chronic after that fact and require ongoing significant medical care for the rest of their life. And so unfortunately, this can be a diagnosis that is financially devastating, even for people who have reasonable means to begin with, have health insurance, etc. And that's something that I've seen in my own practice that is just incredibly difficult. We expend an enormous amount of medical health care energy to save someone, and then their entire life and the life of their family is irrevocably changed by the cost of trying to manage their life for the next several decades. Sure. And that's for the simple want of a helmet, preventable. Absolutely. And that's where I developed my interest in this problem in the first place, was seeing patients that I felt like could have been spared so much of that agony if they had made a different, fairly simple decision. I've seen some helmets. Charles Owens is here or in the lobby. I've seen a few helmets in the Western world that look like a cowboy hat. What other kind of helmets do we have out there that maybe not hide the fact, but bling up the fact we're wearing a helmet, if you will, that maybe maybe that's something we look at some of the manufacturers and say, hey, let's look at some of these styles. Yeah, I think coming up with something that's comfortable and stylish is, you know, is the, the key role of the manufacturers in this process. As long as it meets the equestrian helmet certification, I could care less what it looks like. It could look like a box on your head. I think there's a variety of different ways to design things, but there's also some physical limitations to what this is going to look like. There's a, a clear standard that's a good standard in place to the ASTM, and there's not going to be endless options of how you can create a safety device that fits that standard. So in some ways, I think we've got to ask the manufacturers to listen to their customers and make things stylish and interesting. But we also need to look at ourselves and look at our own culture and say, well, let's Let's look at ourselves as athletes. Let's wear athletic gear. Athletic gear includes safety equipment. This is a high-risk sport. You don't see people in motocross races without helmets on. That's just part of their gear, and it looks cool, and they make it different colors and put stickers on it. I don't know. We've got to look at ourselves as athletes and dress ourselves in the same way. In our neighborhood down in Davie, Florida, we have a number of trail ride businesses around that require people to wear helmets. If they don't want to wear a helmet someone else has already worn, sometimes they bring their bicycle helmet. Is that something acceptable from a... No. And first off, I'd say I commend those trail riding organizations for doing that because that's the rarity and that is wonderful. It's probably liability-based, but great. But no, a bike helmet is not an acceptable helmet for riding. There's a different standard for every different sport helmet out there. Bike helmets in particular are made for forward pitching falls. So most bike injuries happen when you go over the handlebars of your bike and you fall flat on your forehead. Equestrian helmets are built for blows to the head that can come from other directions as well, from the back, from the side, etc. And so the coverage area is a little bit different, and they're made to a specific standard that is based on the most likely equestrian injuries. So it's not a good idea to swap sports. Now, there are some helmets out there that are certified under a variety of different sports certifications. Bike helmets I just brought from my kids are certified for rollerblading and skateboarding and various other things in addition to bike riding. But as far as I'm aware, I don't know if there are any equestrian helmets that are certified against for other sports or vice versa. Thank you so very much for this. This is stuff that people need to pay more and more attention to. How else do we get this information to people than tell them? So Absolutely. Kind of well, I think this is a great service that you're doing and uh, hopefully we'll reach a lot of the people that need to hear this.